and welcome to this edition of Convo Fango. Heavens to Betsy, I am gobsmacked to be joined today by Werewolves Within writer Mishna Wolf and director Josh Rubin. Yay! <laughs> Thank Hello. you guys so much Yay for coming for to hang us. out. Yay. Yay for us. We did. Cheer for yourselves. <laughs> Everyone cheer for yourself now. Come on. Graphic yeah. tea crew, you know, graphic oh, tea yeah, crew. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got, you can barely see mine, but I was trying to be a little bit on theme. <laughs> Whoa, dig it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so uh, give me the hot beaver fueled goss. What's going on, guys? <laughs> <laughs> hot That's all I got. Goss. Those are all the Mr. quotes I was going to work German. in. <laughs> What's the Janine? Uh, you know what I mean? No, I, uh, <laughs> I Heavens to Betsy. Heavens to <laughs> Betsy. I love it. All right, so for starters, tell us what Werewolves Within is all about. No. Either, either one, whoever wants to take it. <laughs> Neither of us, huh? Neither? Well, you guys oh, leave it up to me? me? <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, what isn't it? You know, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's an indie, it's Hollywood, it's French, it's, it's, it's black and white, it's color, um, it's, uh, it's knives out. It's claws out. Um, it's about a small town that um, that basically collides over uh, over change and progress, much like the small town or small town surrounding um, that I grew up here in uh, the Hudson Hudson Valley, um, which is why I was so attracted to Mishnah's script. Um, You're doing amazing, by the way, yeah, Josh. I, I want to meander. I want to meander. Um, <laughs> it's French. It's scary. It's French. Um, <laughs> it's got a uh, le, le end. It ends in le end. It ends in <laughs> le end. Um, Gerard Depardieu was going to play. He's amazing. <laughs> amazing yeah. in this. I did not mean to. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, but you know, hey, it's a, a werewolf terrorizes a small town that's uh, butting heads over, uh, over a lot of change. Change mainly being this like gas pipeline. It's up to Sam Richardson, Finn Wheeler, the local forest ranger, and Cecily. Who knows who her last name is? Uh, Moore. She Bible actually, she's Cecily Moore. She Cecily Moore. <laughs> uh, okay, it's okay. Of, you know, what's terrorizing this small town? And we have ourselves uh, one hell of a creature feature. If you, you don't mind my saying so, I don't know what you think, Mishnah, but I think we've done great. I think it's good fun in the dark. What can I say? If, it's if good you, fun in the dark. Good fun in the dark. It's not the only good fun in the dark, but it's a type of good fun in the dark. <laughs> Hashtag That's also my Tinder justice. headline. Yeah. Hashtag, right. yeah. <laughs> Thank <Love> you. <laughs> that was a hell of a rundown, guys. Like, I just want to, that was nice. Thank you. <laughs> We're great in the room. Great for just a tight log line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> concise. Just the elevator that was my, my favorite. My one note on that was like, it was just so damn concise. I love it. <laughs> I do a tight dive. That's why I covered my mouth and pointed to me <laughs> yeah that's a whodunit it's a horror it's a comedy it's got a little rom-com it's there's something for everyone <laughs> it's a, there is something for everyone yeah definitely yes <laughs> so how did this project come to be like mishna did you see the, the video game and you're like i would love to make a story on this or like what was the like what's the evolution of that <laughs> so um i was a uh, fellow number one in the ubisoft women's fellowship um they had this great fellowship where women, where women, where women, <laughs> there, was, there was actually, there was a TV fellow too, where women could come in and play games. And where women come play games. <laughs> women come play women games. play game, like game lots. <laughs> and they, they, I was like, free game, sign me up. Um, and, uh, you know, I played this, uh, I played this whodunit and uh, I got in there. It was a lot of, uh, arguing and I was like oh, that that is fun like I, I got into this this VR room and and even watched gameplay and they people were really arguing in the in the gameplay and I was like oh this is like conflict that's the basis for a story um so it, it, it was one that just sort of kept me up at night because this conflict could be about anything. And, you know, the private justice element was awesome right off the bat. It really seemed to be a microcosm of sort of human foils uh, in, in one concise little VR game. And so uh, I brought it to the, the, the executives at Ubisoft who 
were really smart. They're really, they were instrumental in the development of the story. And um, they were like, yeah, we love this run with it. So um, I, I sort of brought them the town of Beaverfield. That was like the first conception. What if, you know, it's like a rural area, but it's gentrifying. And what if like everyone in it has their own ideology that is a conflict with everyone else's and <laughs> and then you know what if they take the law into their own hands and they were like yeah this is this is yeah let's pitch it <laughs> so uh <laughs> so uh yeah that's that was sort of the inception and then uh josh came on and made it real made it all <laughs> real it was how right. did you get involved josh well uh the producing partners <clears throat> ubisoft hired um vanishing angle they came to see a rough cut of my first film scare me a fat long excruciating rough cut and they still walked away going wow you know what this guy can also do uh, more contained uh horror uh comedy in a blizzard and um, they uh, brought me Misha's script, <laughs> and um, I was terrified. And fully, to... and fully. Let's. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what he also, you know what he also do? Really good uh, fully. That's true. Like, you know, just that was breaking bones. Um, you know what I mean? A real soundscape. Uh, Incredible. And they somehow, they somehow were like, "Yeah, you'd be great. Do you want to pitch your, uh, you know, throw your hat in the ring um, for this video game adaptation?" I heard the words video adaptation, Angel, and I just, I, you know, I almost peed my, my peed um, because, I, I, you know, it doesn't have a great rep, um, but I thought, why not? I'll take a look. Um, I like the budget size. It felt comfortable to jump from my, my modest little picture. I opened Mishnah's script and immediately I was um, engulfed in imagery from arachnophobia to Fargo to hot fuzz. It made me think of some of my favorite films, especially horror comedies like, like arachnophobia. Um, come on, and, uh, come on. You know, like, I know, it, just, <laughs> it really hit. And it was so thrilling to think, holy crap, I could take a swing at, um, you know, in a rare sort of uh, subgenre of horror uh, or a rare horror uh, creature, which is which is the werewolf. It feels like, you know, the, the few times it's been done really, really well, it's like been done really, really well. And when it hasn't, it's just, you know, it's a big swing and a miss. Um, so I thought, why the hell not? The script was just too good to be true. I saw a great opportunity to bring in comedic actors that could play vulnerable and play scary. Um, and I just kind of pitched all that. And like I mentioned, you know, up at the top when I wasn't saying the word French nine or 10 times just to be a silly. Yeah. You know, I thought. Bien, uh, sir. <laughs> can, sir. Can, sir. Can, sir. Can, sir. Inclined to be an open, a raw nerve. Uh, I thought this remind me of the, of the small town I grew up in, the small town surrounding here in the Hudson Valley. And, um, not only did I get the gig, but also we were able to shoot it um, in Phoenicia, New York, in Fleischmann's, New York, in Kingston, New York, and like in the area that was so inspiring and scary to me as a kid. <laughs> That's awesome. Can I talk about watching Scare Me for the first time now? Please do. Because yes. I watched Scare Me. <laughs> they sent me a cut of Scare Me before I um, ever I met think Josh. I, know story. I think before you were even on hired, I think they sent me a cut of Scare Me and I watched Scare Me. And one of the things I was super concerned with about this movie was the timing. Um, mm. Because I had this sort of timing in my head. And, you know, it, I'm really rhythm oriented um, as far as like writing and momentum and things like that go. And when I saw Scare Me, I was like, oh, he's got like, no, like, this is like, no, this is a, per like, this is a perfect match. Cause your timing in that movie, it was like, pop, 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 pop. And I was like, oh, this is going to really like, he, he's going to be amazing. Get that was, with him. Oh, I was so tickled by the rhythm of it. it the pacing, the, the timing, there was just like a, there was a, there was a rhythm that like jived with my little ADD brain. I was just like, I'm so tickled by the, the, the Foley work too. was just like from beginning to end. It just really, it really, really kept the, the momentum going in the pace. And I just felt like, oh, this is a great fit. I love that so much. That's amazing. Josh, is that the first time you've heard that? 
That's the first. That's I think that I think that is. I mean, because I thought I thought Misha threw her laptop across the room and was like, "How could you?" You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and they forced they forced her to go with this hired gun. I mean, that is no, what happened, but she also liked the rhythm. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Well, not I mean, what happened. Uh, no, it's not what happened. I yeah, it makes me very glad that I took the risk. Uh, you know, to 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 make a thing it's a very privileged you know position to be in to be able to like you know what i'm just gonna like gamble on this thing but this thing this little this little movie this little genre flick turned out to be you know wonderful to open this wonderful door to be able to to lead me to to this project and you know and and here we are they're calling it like the best video game adaptation ever the best reviewed especially and just kind of like yeah yeah we did it you oh, threaded, it threaded that needle it was <laughs> <laughs> oh so great which I, means I, I i hope it means people send me free games that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, people send me games please send me games <laughs> the real motivation behind writing this script is send her some games send, send the me games. free games yeah. rockstar free epic games. come on <laughs> I hope I hope that you get all the games like showing up on your doorstep starting next week. <laughs> I do too. I really do too. I play on PlayStation and Switch. If you <laughs> get, get all those shouted out, anyone wants to send me some games. <laughs> I love that you mentioned uh, the rhythm and the pacing of Scare Me because the rhythm and the pacing super stood out to me in Werewolves Within because I was I was laughing my ass off at this movie like truly really like out loud laughing my ass off like a couple of times I think my dogs looked at me like what the fuck are you doing because I'm just like laughing but then I, I jumped and I was like there's like there's actual horror and like great tension buildup but just like that rhythm of like the comedy and the horror but it's just like it, oh just so fucking good like I had so much fun watching this you guys just like you like just blew that's it all Josh nailed it <laughs> Oh, well, Josh. <laughs> no, it's both of you. I would say it's a combination of you guys. Like, it's Very just, it was just both. so fun. Yes. Yeah. yeah and Brett, Brett, I feel like um, his, his post was, his post work was tight. <clears throat> Our editor was, is out of control. Brett Bachman also did Mandy, but, and like the vigil, and now he's doing Toxic Avenger for Legendary. Oh, he is just so, <laughs> he's so <laughs> crazy good. Like, just, and he was, he was, he would challenge me to just be better and 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 open up the narrative a bit more and pull back on exposition and lean in where we, you know he felt he needed it as that that objective um, third set of eyes, which is what a great editor does. And and uh, yeah, it was just it was brilliant. What a what a wonderful experience. Amazing. So you guys both have uh, backgrounds in comedy. Obviously, do you find similarities between comedy and horror? Like as you're doing this. I, I, can I, can I say it? Is that, uh, um, so I have, <laughs> I had a friend at a horror um, film company a long time ago say that um, comedy and, and, um, and horror comes from the same animal, which is this weird, like, uh, like sick mind that wants to control how people are feeling. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> he was, he was like, oh, you know, you could do horror. And I was like, I was doing stand up at the time and I was, super young I was in my early 20s and I was like you can do more but I was like oh come on I can I'm, I'm just a little girl um you know I didn't I, I didn't have the the same kind of bravado I have I have fallen into since saying <laughs> saying no to learning how to say no to little people <laughs> um but um but yeah I I I I, I do understand it, it comes from that place of, and Josh you have a lot of experience in this you know when you're sort of controlling a room and making a, an audience out of a disparate group of people there's a lot of manipulative like weird control freakism that goes into that where it's like I'm going to control how you feel um and it, it's you know it's pro there's probably a 12-step meeting for it um <laughs> it's probably something that should be medicated I don't know I was going to say, like, but, but yeah, my my need for that or desire for that, I think what I'm realizing in directing is just like to avoid humiliation. I can control, <laughs> like, as a smaller human being, uh, yeah. the hair, the hairy, chubby, friendless kid, like, I, you know, that I was, like, <laughs> that I can control if I control this like troop of actors to, to like, you know, do my rhythm or you know, like, like say these lines to my cadence and in a way that I feel in my bones. Yeah, it's interesting, but. uh 
I don't know. I mean, gr- growing up watching watching the kind of horror, at least that that I did, it was so affecting because it was um, it all had a rhythm to it. Freddy Krueger had a rhythm to it, like oh, you know, sure. schlocky sort of like you know Stephen King movies, like Mick Garris's work, we just, who we just talked to. Like it, it um, it, most of the stuff that at least was formative to me had this wonderful like pacing and vibe. It wasn't just horror; it was also comedy with heart. It was genre bending, and I think. As comedians too, I think we're kind of learning or it's been articulated to me recently and I couldn't quite do it myself that folks who come up in horror, whether it's myself, Mishnah, Jordan Peele, uh, John Krasinski, people who actually like know how to play with genre and test the limits of what's, um, you know, what can be heartbreaking, but, but funny, what can be terrifying, but funny. Um, there's, uh, I don't know, there's kind of a special sauce or, or uh, uh, you know, like a, like a third, uh, a, a gland for it or something, you know, <laughs> um, that we just, just all kind of have a sense for. I don't know what it is. Oh, I, I think too, like, I really grew up loving the films of John Carpenter and I saw every single one and mm. um, it was, you know, I went back and saw ones that came out before I was watching movies. And, you know, I, I realized in hindsight, you know, those syncopated quarter notes like he used in Halloween that sort of build the, the, the pressure, the, the sort of tension in the, in the, in the scenes, it's really, um, it's timing, you know, it's like, there's a, there's a symphony to it that I think mm. tickled my little timing math brain. And, and those, I just remember the, 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 the way he's, it's no accident, he's also a conductor, you know, and, and a, sorry, not a conductor, mm. a composer. Composing. You know, I think there's something very musical to the way sort of horror films can, can unfold. I love that. That's great. And I love that you, your initial uh, explanation of it is you're just basically orchestrating and controlling what the room is going to feel and that was a bit of the appeal of it (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) i want to hear you laugh and i'm going to scare the shit out of you yeah (laughs) wow just as soon as you said it there was a crazy crack of thunder you like really brought the was was that what it was yeah talk about timing and rhythm Uh, (laughs) thunder Oh, you guys are impressive. That was impressive. Bringing the thunder and everything. (laughs) I thought it was just your impressive Foley, but you actually brought the thunder. Even to a panel, (laughs) you really bring it the Atmo, you know, the Atmo. The lightning. lightning. (laughs) You guys had an amazing cast on this. Like, I, obviously I love Finn, but I loved everybody, even the kind of assholey characters. Like I just loved all of them because everyone was just like bringing it like full force and everyone was just such a character like an ensemble cast but there's not anyone that got kind of like left behind or overshadowed like everybody was just like fucking full-on bringing it and just hilarious and i'm kind of wondering about like the genesis of the humor like how much of it was in the script how much of it came of like you guys collaborating was there anything that was ad-libbed because they're just like zingers like so many in there (laughs) there there are zingers i mean like misha phrased this really well the other day um and it makes a lot of sense each, each character is a color, you know, not unlike Clue. Um, each character was, is kind of a representative, I want to say archetype, but, you know, um, you, they, they just kind of pounce off the page. So much of the homework was done for so many of the actors, and then it became about molding for them, you know, uh, motivations or creep factor, or when I'm sequestered, how kind of breakdown is my breakdown, you know, um, those kind of, you know, questions to kind of hone in um, just for tone. But um, we didn't have a whole lot of time to improvise. We didn't have a whole lot of time to um, to play because it was a fast shoot, but but every one of these actors pretty much, or at least, at least half of them came up in comedy. So folks like Harvey Guillen and Sam and George and Sarah, for example, they're all gonna, you know, kind of pop out some of the funniest one-liners you've ever heard. And you're like, shit, well, I have to use those. Um, but- Michaela Watkins. Oh, oh, Michaela. I mean, like, that's the thing is they're all, <laughs> even Glenn Fleshler, who's incredible in Barry, also plays the Yellow King in True Detective. And so you have the, you know, everybody truly bringing it, but everyone from you know, Kathy Curtin to Michael Chernus, they're, they're, they're all, um, they all brought their A-game um, pulling tears, you know, and, and, uh, and, and maxing out creep factor, whether it was, and they, w- they would have done it, whether this was like a Joe Swanberg movie, a Chekhov play or a horror film. And that's just a testament to the script. So um, 
there was very little I feel like I needed to do at least as far as the actors were concerned it was like casting folks who I knew could do the thing could like play the color could play into the archetype and then fill it out with interesting choices I mean yeah I have to say as a writer it's really interesting to see how you know my idea for a story then gets filtered through other lenses and comes out this beautiful tapestry I mean I can only color in so much and then, you know, Josh comes to the script and it's filtered through his lens. And then the actors come to the script and they filter it through their lenses. And what, and then Brett comes and, and, yeah, the, Brett, and, and yeah. then Brett, and then the, the, yeah. the, then the composer comes and, and it's just so glorious to see, you know, how my blueprint for a much bigger product, uh, a much, you know, you know, it's like, it's a blueprint for a fucking beautiful office building and you know it's like you don't look at the blueprint and say wow this is glorious um but um when you see it you know what i mean you, you, yeah. you know like ooh, nice marble no you don't, don't look at the yeah. blueprint and say like and the oh, plants where, where'd yeah. you find the stone um where did the tile come from um but it, it's really fun as a writer to see those those let all those lenses and you know, this just very human org, it becomes its own organism and it's really exciting. It has to be really fun too, to like write a joke. It plays a certain way in your head, the way that you're reading it on the page. And then to see it come to life by like, then like, and then have you guys watched this with an audience, right? You got to actually see this with other humans. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So then like hearing people like laughing or, you know, or like gasping at like certain points, like that had to be just so fun. Yeah, it's funny because in my head, jokes are all thrown away. Like in my head when I'm writing, like th that's a throwaway, that's a throwaway, that's a throwaway. Uh -huh. So uh, when people nail the joke and it works, I'm like, huh, huh. <laughs> 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 she, she, she went right on that and she like stuck the joke. Hmm. But, yeah. it, but it totally works, you know? Yeah. <laughs> they really made it their own. Yeah, yeah, that's the magic of casting. I mean, so much of it is... Uh, so much of casting really, so much of good directing really is the casting. And, and it was like, you know that if you get George Basil or Milana or Sam, oh my or God. really any of this cast, that you, so are, you are going to land all the jokes. And, but also all of the like vulnerable moments, also mm -hmm. all of the moments of intimidation and terror and finger pointing. And, and you're gonna really going to feel it. Yeah, that's the other thing too. It was, it was funny as hell, but also there's like, a lot of the characters are so endearing in a lot of different ways. So like, that was interesting. Yeah. And Sam is just so like, just, he's just so freaking like expressive and you just love him. And then he has his little like Mr. Rogers quotes and it's just like, he just plays it so, so sweet and so well. And then there's a part and I think his line was just what, but he's like the way that he says it. And I was dying, love. but also I was just like, like, it's so funny, but it was so fucking real because I'm like, that's, probably what would come out of my mouth at that moment. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, what else are you going to say? And that's one of those moments that was just, that just kind of happened. I was just, you know, you, you just let the camera roll and here's an actor who you wouldn't think, you think, oh, well, comedically, yeah, he'll say some funny lines and, um, and you know, we'll keep the camera rolling and that'll kind of be that. But you, Guillermo del Toro said something about comedic actors operating at the top of their, um, at the top of their game, essentially, when they're when they're crossing genres, which is they're automatically playing at 100% comedically. But in a drama, a comedic actor will also be pushing to land those vulnerable moments, those terrorized moments. And my whole MO for the cast was within the confines of not getting caught trying to be funny, within the confines of actually being terrified with, that, with actually playing hysteria, you can be as big as you want. You can kind of, you know, you can, you can do your thing. And if you leave room for that, you get some, the magic of moments like that, of mm -hmm. Sam laying there and, you know, being close to tears after this traumatic, you know, moment. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and also a myriad of other ones. That definitely felt like, I love that line. I love that what, it's so great. And I, it really <laughs> felt like him playing the truth of the moment in such a great way um, that I certainly didn't think of when I was writing um, and he, really like his face in that moment too is just like it is it is a what the f moment you know 100 <laughs> percent. very so honest it's like yeah and you think i mean like okay the line is like what you know what i mean but it's like yeah i, didn't, no, I did not like, write that what <laughs> oh 
Oh, you did I not cannot write take that credit for okay, that. Okay. Nope. An one. nope. That was. <laughs> did you write that what, Josh? I don't think I wrote that what. <laughs> no, it's just that is just pure Sam Richardson <laughs> making it work. A, that was a jazz what. That's a raw That's what. We what. Call a jazz <laughs> what. <laughs> oh, get those. Jazz what. <laughs> it was that's what did it for me was the hands i was like i'm sold it sold it for me 100 yeah, percent. that was his that was his dizzy gillespie moment there's a well, lot it there. worked wonderfully <laughs> oh man um he's got so many great lines so let me see here um i want to talk a little bit about the social commentary in it and mm. it's like so many different layers to it but it's done in such a way that it's not it, it flows very naturally because you have such a cast of characters. So they can, they all very naturally like me to like you're the reason you want to do this in the first place. You have all these different personality types and people have their own ideologies about things. So it all came together like in a very natural way. Do you want to talk yeah, a little bit about I, that? I think, a, I think a horror movie um, without social commentary is just a wasted opportunity. <laughs> Personally, um, it lends itself really well to social commentary. And I don't think I totally realized that until the Jordan Peele movies started coming out. Um, but even like Jennifer's body, um, and there were, there were a few, they live, um, uh, are great examples of wonderful social commentary in horror movies and toxic Avenger, obviously. <laughs> um, but, uh, for me, the joy in this was, uh, creating a torture device for a really nice person who believes that people should connect and have discourse. Um, and meet in the middle of their ideologies. And so Finn Wheeler was designed to enter this group of people in conflict and be so uncomfortable with this conflict. <laughs> that was always, you know, it was the whole movie is meant to be a torture device for someone who believes these things. And yet I think it's really uplifting at the end. And I think that, you know, while it, it says something about, you know, sort of the desperation and the darkness of the human soul it also says some nice things as well about sort of our, our ideologies and our ability to connect with one another and our common humanity yeah. <laughs> amen <laughs> i identify with finn quite a bit so i really i really enjoyed watching <laughs> him navigate and like you know quoting mr rogers to this community like i was like oh i feel this deeply <laughs> Yeah, and then Mr. Rogers' thread is something that Josh wove in, that he brought to the table and he really wove oh, through nice. the script and and that was 100% Josh Rubin. Um, and I think I mean, it really- also is, it, Yeah, it came in late. You know, that's something that as you're kind of developing it with, with the folks at Ubisoft, you kind of realize, okay, thematically, what else can we bring to the surface? And um, I think it, I, I'd like to think it only helps. People seem to be, you know, talking quite a bit about that. But it is teeming rain. I have to close these windows. I have to show you. It is, <laughs> Whoa, I'm very jealous right now. <laughs> Are you getting the hurricane weather? Is it like some hurricane? It must be. I'm, I'm just going to take you on a tour and close these windows. There's like <laughs> water coming in the room. But yes, Mr. Oh, Rogers. <laughs> Boy, did it play it well thematically for, for Sam. My, one of my favorite moments was him improvising, uh, you know, running down the details of uh, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood to try and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> illuminated for Mr. Flynn. Oh, that's such a King great, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Land of make-believe, there's puppets. Yeah, <laughs> that was so fun. It was <laughs> really fun, <laughs> yeah. really fun. <laughs> oh, and then, uh, let's see. A lot of like, so the social commentary, you guys did this before COVID and then now mm. watching it now, I'm like, oh, there's like all these, like there's like these kind of like, uncomfortably relevant moments you know but then it also goes back like this stuff is like old as shit you know there's like twilight zone episodes that have that kind of center around the same kind of theme and stuff so it's just kind of interesting and uncomfortable like oh yeah sometimes. i know i think i know the twilight zone episode you're talking about yeah <laughs> so, was it the amazing? lights are on in that house but they're not on in that yeah, house yes yeah uh, oh, God. <laughs> Yeah, so it was just kind of like that was an interesting thing, just to it, it just an uncomfortable awareness, I guess, to be to realize like, oh, this is this kind of stuff is just it's existed for a very long time, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and private justice is an interesting theme you see play out a lot in in different uh, disaster events and 
triage situations, certainly, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's always been fascinating to me when people have to make decisions around when they, people play God, right? Yeah. Like yeah. that's always been, you know, it's, it's always been a preoccupation for me as just like humans playing God. Um, to, uh, that has probably almost nothing to do with this movie, but a uh, little non sequitur. <laughs> No, no, no it has to do with the private justice. Absolutely. There is an there is an element of that in any private justice sort of story. Yeah, hundred percent, absolutely mm-hmm. is. Yeah, and it always makes me very uncomfortable whenever I see it. So <laughs> so bad. It's so bad. It's good. <laughs> yeah. So cringy. It's just like because it's so it's real, you know. Like I wish it wasn't, but there's so there's too too much uh there's a lot of real elements in that and that just makes me very uncomfortable because i would like to be like oh that would never happen and then i'm like oh but it does like bleh. it's so crazy <laughs> like michaela played a karen before karen was like in the zeitgeist <laughs> uh-huh. and i thought for sure that even her antifa line would be a shelf life you know cutting room floor sort of a thing and it was one of those things that sort of stuck maybe even by nature of like footage, like, well, that kind of, that's kind of something we need is she's leaving. There's only so many takes we can use. And look at what's continuing to happen in this country <laughs> and how many of, how many Trishes, if Trish is the new Karen, are kind of emerging, like just from that sort of, you know, that sort of angle of it. And we are continuing mm-hmm. to finger point and continuing to make it very difficult for the, you know, the, the good people, for the heroes, like continuing, as Mishna said, like to, continue the metaphor like the torture device for the the um the, the, those of us who are good remains to spin like the cogs of that remain to uh <laughs> remain to turn for those of us who are trying to shake the shit out of the people who are you know um adamant that you know the uh, the truth doesn't exist or whatever it is and and those people when pushed i mean uh they like good people can you know come to a sort of a violent hilt um Mm -hmm. and that's that's a yeah that's a truly terrifying thing especially when you put such disparate personalities under one roof during a blizzard yes (laughs) and then like just the lines of like oh pitting this community against itself you know it's like your fear and your greed and your own petty nature but then you know he comes in with a it's effing okay to be nice and i'm like yes it is it's okay to be nice (laughs) It was really important to me that when I was writing that I wasn't taking a side um, either, that it was, um, that it was just about conversation, common humanity, coming together, even, even with disparate ideologies. I mean, um, you know, while a pipeline near a national forest is a horrible thing, you know, in these small towns where people have had their land for a zillion years and, and they haven't really thought it was worth much and, and someone comes in to write a check, um, you know, it is a situation where, you know, it could mean a lot for, for somebody who had this, you know, cheap land that, uh, that's suddenly worth something. And that, that could be a whole, whole, you know, so it was really important for me too, to sort of see it from all sides. And, Mm -hmm. and also, you know, when I was, when I was thinking about Emerson Flint, I was watching a lot of Alaskan Bush people, um, (laughs) Love and that. uh you know and it's like getting into that ideology too of like a survivalist ideology and mm-hmm. and just like boy can they put up a house quickly just like <laughs> just, it like it's like and- one episode there's a house yeah. it's <laughs> they're splitting logs and then it's a trapper shack now it's a house oh, man. So it was very much yeah it was very much presented in a way it wasn't like it was like taking sides or like fucking like spoon feeding you this ideology or this one it was like it just was and i think that was the coolest part of it is because you have such different opposing personalities but then they're just they just are you know what i mean so you get the whole Mm -hmm. kind of spectrum of like they feel this way because of this and then they feel this way because of this so it was like a cool way to present it because the, the characters i thought all of them were likable in some sort of way even the ones that you're like not my favorite there's something likable to them there and then to see mm. their reasoning for something that's kind of a cool thing and i, I, love I as a comedy person I, I and just and just as a writer in general i love human flaws it's it, it's what makes yeah. characters interesting it's what's make the, it, what it's what sorry it's what makes them lovable nobody likes um perfect people or smugness or Mm-hmm. um sanctimoniousness like it's really or even like you know it's like when 
you know, I, you know, I like a John McEnroe kind of athlete when I'm watching. <laughs> <laughs> They're more entertaining. You know, it's the poor, it's the poor sports of the world that. <laughs> Give me but, a love handle, you know, <laughs> like, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't watch CNN for you to be humble. <laughs> I mean, not CNN, ESPN. I, I don't watch C- ESPN for the humility. Oh, man. <laughs> I want to oh, see God. some egomania, you know, oh, uh, it, they, you know, these human <laughs> flaws are just fascinating. They're fun. They're entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> the poor sports of the world. There. The poor <laughs> sports of the world. <laughs> Throw a tennis racket now, man. <laughs> it's true, though. You know, I mean, you're not wrong. That is the interesting shit, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it gives you something to write about. <laughs> I mean, that's the wonderful thing about this script is that it had this Coen Brothers irreverence, this this quirk, this texture to every character and tr- you know true to agatha christie fashion everyone can be implicated even at some point you know you, you can raise your eyebrow at finn which is so wonderful and that you know every- and everybody's justified hopefully that comes across as justifiable um you know uh, motive for every character it's the wonderful thing about the, the writing of it all yes absolutely oh <laughs> I just I just want you guys to go back and forth and say like okay now you say something nice I'm just gonna watch like I'm just like this is nice I like this (laughs) the sequence saying I've learned a lot I literally told Misha I was like I'm I'm stealing a um uh, there's something you do in writing sequence and writing action where you go as dash dash to uh to elicit the next scene to like evoke the the like the literal momentum as you're reading um which is the smallest sort of device um, possibly by, you know, uh, uh, at, at first look, but it's such a helpful device for me as a writer who's always been trying to figure out reading, you know, from William Goldman to, you know, God knows. William Tom, Goldman. Tom, Tom Perota. Yeah. You, Tom Perota is like, amazing. Out, yeah. Yeah. You, try, you know, from very studying. generous, <laughs> very generous writer. Yeah. I mean, little, you could read fucking misery or you could read the script for little children and pick up on different things as a writer like devices to kind of call in your own writing but Misha has a um it's a it's a really effective it's way tick. of articulating it's called a tick <laughs> yeah she has this great tick that makes her just an awesome writer for action I'm kind of like well I'm gonna steal that so anyway I, 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 I number one well I mean I feel like so much that that little dash dash thing I do is it's about a reveal right so there's like yeah, every yeah. scene has like five reveals or six reveals I mean uh so much of writing and and so much of dra- dramatic momentum is about misdirection um, and then surprise, you know, so I, I, I try and imbue scenes with that so that when people are writing, they can sort of see where the, where the reveal, where the beats of reveal are even within a single scene. Um, but that's enough nerd talk for your audience. <laughs> <laughs> no, this yeah, is actually, really this is the place to do the nerd talk. I mean, I feel like that's what the audience wants. Like, this is nerdy even Here. for nerd talk like i don't know i mean i'm a nerd uh, and i'm like yes give me more dash. of this <laughs> yeah. the dash, dash dash dashes well now dash i want to read the script yeah <laughs> you can i think they're i think it's i think the writer it probably has it i think it okay. probably is available somewhere all right so. i need to see these ticks for myself as well the ticks the ticks the, the dash dashes <laughs> yeah um, do you guys have a favorite character slash a character that you would say that you identify most with in this? Misha, I'm curious. <laughs> um, I am such a silent fly on the wall observer of these characters. It would be very hard to put myself into one of the characters. Um, but if I had to, I would say I'm the werewolf. Okay, nice. Oh. <laughs> Man, what a fucking cool answer. All right. <laughs> I'm such a Finn Wheeler. I'm such a... Uh, or you are a Finn Wheeler. I'm such I want to say Finn. that with compliments. Absol- I mean, and I, and I take it compl- And also, so is Sam Richardson. Sam and I, I think, had an unspoken understanding, especially once we were kind of pouring open the um, it's fucking okay to be nice, which was a late ad. Like it was a late, there were constant adjustments to um, to, to the script as there are in all production. You know, it, it changes throughout, you know, the whole shoot, which is sort of, you know, can be frustrating, but ended up sort of being 
kind of wonderful here because we're finding things about the theme that we go, this could be an op this previous scene where this magic moment came out, we can apply it to, you know, uh, to the climax as we're barreling towards it. And, and, and also Sam's it. a producer on the movie. Yeah, exactly, awesome. exactly. And I, I mean- so yeah, Makes sense, you tweak. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> like, you know what, we should also, we should pour this open uh, as a capital P producer, as they call it. Um, uh, but yeah, I think I think there's like um, uh, just an understanding, just as like nice people who also have a a temper. Like Sam, Sam for different reasons. You know, Sam is a, a he's a black man in America who once he's phrased that he has like the Hulk. He says, you know how the Hulk says, "I'm I'm always angry," and it's always accessible. It's always there. It's something that Sam did in an interview with, actually with Harvey Guillen for Vulture, like right after we wrapped. That's really stuck with me. Like like Bruce, you know, uh, how, how do you get that angry? And it's like, I'm always angry. And, and that really stuck with me. Obviously, again, that's a different experience and from a different experience, life experience for Sam, but he's also someone who um, wants people to be good, who wants to be good to and for other people. And that's been my experience for my whole life, you know, as someone who grew up with a lioness mother and, um, you know, humanitarian people uh, sort of all around me um, and finding myself surprised when others weren't polite or others didn't hold the door. And then to listen to that kind of, especially as like a smaller human being, that was like my thing, um, uh, to only be, be met with rudeness or humiliation. Um, and that's such an interesting human quality um, to recognize in yourself, like, oh, like, I just wish they could fucking hold the door the way that I want to um or that I would for you you want you want people to be good in return so anyway long story, but it, it takes a lot for longer. Sam to get to that place I mean oh, not Sam yeah, I should say yeah. Finn it takes Finn yeah. uh, it takes a lot to push him to that place in this movie yeah and same I think that's I think that's um probably the most identifiable you know quality of it all is being like you know all of us have that werewolf within that is accessible that that can be brought to the service for different <laughs> means in some cases it's for you know um uh, aggression for financial gain um where that being the drive as you see with some of the characters in this film or in other cases it's like why the fuck can't we just come together as a humanity like as, as a community for the sake of humanity and like take hands and get out of this terrible situation together and that's so identifiable uh you know to me for sure but also i'm the werewolf so. <laughs> <laughs> but also obviously i'm the werewolf yeah okay <laughs> mm. is there anything else you guys would like to share with us in particular anything about shooting cool stories anything fun favorite moment Mishna stopped by and i said guys this is Mishna, the writer and everybody oh my everybody was so <laughs> excited to meet <sighs> It was fun. It was fun. That was my like fangirl moment on set. It was so cool. <laughs> People, awesome. they were, everyone was nice to me. Go, were you expecting? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you know, they're, 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 star, they're big stars and just the little writer and they were <laughs> so nice to me. It's so nice. You're the reason why I'm here. And then they just throw a tomato, just throw a rotten tomato. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're the reason why I'm here. I hate that line. <laughs> I just wanted to say it's specifically for a certain line. <laughs> um, yeah, I do remember. I do remember though giving. Someone did ask me for a line read on set, and I was like, "Oh yeah, that's a throwaway. It should be really fast and underneath the action." And the, and, and and they did that, and it 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 made it into the edit because I thought we were gonna. I thought we were gonna ditch the line. That's Royal Crown Derby because um, it wasn't working and I was like yeah that's a total throwaway it's it does not get its own it's just like just throw it away yeah that was brilliant yeah and it, it worked it, it it finally I'm glad it made it in because it seemed like it was it was it felt like a little oblong for us it was a little clumsy for a second it was hard to you know it was like mm -hmm. no it's a total throw away. <laughs> no don't care just throw it away please don't overthink it yeah throw it away throw it away you know she's like you're <laughs> the only one that cares nobody else cares <laughs> don't announce don't announce yeah. that's, they that's would throw it all against you. the wall these people do not care about your china <laughs> <laughs> 
and they're walking, they're steamrolling, <laughs> they're steamrolling you, um, oh, God. <laughs> which, which they do such a lovely job of steamrolling steam Janine all through the movie. I feel like that was a nice, <laughs> her shriek though, over the body was like, oh that, my God, that shot on the porch. I love the way you frame that. It's just like, Mwah. it was so pretty. Yeah, that's the wonderful thing about, you know, it's like when John John Carpenter is like, if you don't have money, at least try and get anamorphics because it'll give you that kind of grand, expensive look and perfect, perfect, perfect thing. I mean, for me, it was like, oh, just that, that'll be my homage to like Bad Moon and uh, Silver Bullet. They shot in this aspect ratio. They shot with these um, and the thing too, you know, Carpen, the Carpenter, the Carpenter anamorphics. But when you're shooting with a cast of 10 or 12, and you do have these sort of, you know, these tableau shots, you have to, you have to shoot with these lenses. And, the, um, the, and it just gives you this wonderful, yeah, shot. And that tableau. was a scene we really wrestled with in development actually, because um, it, oh. it, I, I thought that on the porch scene was really important because it's everybody's, it's sort of like you really get to know the characters in that scene mm. in their reaction to this first body. It's important, it was important to me yeah. to have everyone in a tight for that, you know, so that mm. we see their, you see their faces, their reactions, their reactions to being in this with each other. It's the first time, mm. you know, I, I, I thought you did it just such a great job. And every time I watch the scene, I get a new reaction. Like I <laughs> yeah. see a new character's face and they all have like really funny, their own emotional re Cause it's mostly silent, Janine screaming. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see all their faces. Like I've seen it a few times now and I'm like, Oh, look at his face. Like, that's nice. I like that. That's great. It was great. a crazy thing about editing this thing during the pandemic. Like Brett and I weren't able to meet up in person. So it was over Skype. It was over Evercast. And watching the movie, even though we would, you know, download or stream the mob file or whatever to your TV at the end of the day, you'd be working on this screen and you do miss stuff no matter how many times you watch again and again and again and again. When you see something on the big screen, whether it's, you know, a digital snowflake effect that you're like, God damn, that thing isn't realistic enough or whatever, or it's seeing for the first time, oh my God, Kathy Curtin actually has tears streaming down her face as Dr. Ellis is wheeling away on her chair. It was, it was a detail that I had missed before I'd seen it on a gigantic screen. I might've even missed it in the color session because it is quite subtle that, you know, they, they wash over the, you know, over her complexion. But I think it was at Tribeca where I saw, oh my God, as she's wheeling away, the timing of Kathy Curtin's tears falling from her face. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, you miss, you miss stuff. So yeah. She, she's so have, good, Kathy Curtin and her, um, her agony is hilarious, which I feel bad about, but that's like the point of the character, but I'm still like, like, <laughs> it's, like the, it's still like, it's, she, she really got Janine in such a deep way. She said something wonderful to me, which made me feel good. She was like, you know what? I, this was really fun because I usually play a badass. I usually play a badass, which she does. She, she plays these tough from like bad education to, Orange is the new black to She does you know, usually God play about black. us. <laughs> she she usually plays like like a tough a, you know tough cookie. And she was like, it was really nice to play traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> She does not have trouble finding, I don't want to give away a spoiler, but she does not have trouble finding her inner badass. Yeah, not yeah, at no. all. <laughs> all right, I want to get you guys out of here. I mean, I don't want to get you guys out of here. I need to get you guys out of here, but I will talk to you for another three hours. Uh, <laughs> Misha said, no, okay. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> but this was awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, you guys want to give me your best werewolf howl? Oh, <laughs> is that good is that the same thing that's, that's all right we'll, we'll accept it <laughs> oh <laughs> oh my god that was tom waits tom waits werewolf is that was just, that was that, that was I, I was good that's what i was going for that's actually cool. yeah. that was my yeah oh my gosh tom, tom tom wait, wolf. oh <laughs> I don't have my scorecards handy, but 10 out of 10, 100%. 10 out of 10. <laughs> Man, you guys are so much fun. Thank you. It was really cool to you hang too, out. Angel. I fucking so love much. this movie. So 
thank you. I'm excited that people are loving it and giving it really cool reception because it deserves that. And congratulations, guys. <laughs> thank you for having us. Thank you so much to Mishna and Josh for joining us today. Werewolves Within is now streaming on video on demand. And it is also the cover for volume two, issue 12 of Fangoria. If you're not already subscribed, you missed out on it. Don't let that happen again. Fangoria.com. Get your subscriptions in. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.